Greetings all, that was Jim Keyes. He is the composer of the original score you'll hear performed today behind my telling of Charles Dickens' classic story of hope and redemption. Here we are in historic Boscobel, the house and gardens, along the Hudson River. I'm Jonathan Cruck, with the honor, the privilege, and the joy of serving tonight as your storyteller. This show is being presented by the Foster and Muriel, the Carl Coverlet Gallery at St. Vincent's College, the Trobe, Pennsylvania. When Charles Dickens wrote A Christmas Carol in 1843, it came at a time when people often frowned upon outward celebrations of Christmas. Why, at that time in New England, laws remained on the books prohibiting revelry and merrymaking. Dickens, finding himself aware of this, thought he'd take hold of an old tradition and that is to bring ghosts into the celebrations of Christmas. So he prefaces his work by saying something to the effect of, I hope this uh, ghostly little book doesn't put you out of sorts, but rather that the ghosts in this story put you into the spirit of the season. And thus, I'm happy to present Charles Dickens' classic, A Christmas Carol. Listeners, know this. Jacob Marley was seven years dead. As a door nail. Why not a coffin nail? You'd have to take that up with William Shakespeare. But Marley's passion had been taken up by Mr. Ebenezer Scrooge. He served as Marley's sole partner in business, sole executor, sole friend, and sole mourner. But Scrooge wasn't dreadfully cut up over Marley's passing. Well, he did say, Jacob Marley was a good man of business. Ebenezer Scrooge, you see, was a squeezing, wrenching, clutching, grasping, and dare I'm going to say it, a covetous old sinner, hard as flint, but without a spark of warmth within him. Why, the cold with an Ebenezer Scrooge, it nipped his nose, shrunk in his cheeks, and it stiffened his gait. He wasn't the kind of fellow you would meet on the streets for gladsome greetings. Oh, how you doing there, Scroogey boy? Looking good, looking good, Governor. Oh, Scrooge, why don't you come and dine with us, ah? Why, even the blind man's dog would yelp whenever it saw Scrooge, ow, 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 and tug his master away. Once upon a Christmas time, London, three o'clock in the afternoon Christmas Eve, already the city grew bitingly bleak, cold and dark. But within the counting house of Scrooge and Marley, oh, it was bitter. See, Scrooge permitted the burning of but one piece of coal at a time. Of course, nothing could warm him up, but his clerk tucked away in a little tank, busy with the quill, copying out the ledgers, endeavored to warm his hands over the candle provided to copy those ledgers and to no avail. When, in the midst of this gesture, Merry Christmas! Merry Christmas! May God save you, Uncle! Scrooge's nephew, Fred, comes hallooing into the counting house. Bah, humbug! What, Uncle Scrooge? Christmas, a humbug? What reason do you have to be so merry? You're poor enough. Well, what reason do you have to be so dismal? You're rich enough. Oh, out upon Christmas! Why, what is Christmas? Nothing but a time for spending money you haven't got. Now, now, Uncle, pray don't be cross. Oh, if I could work my will, I would take every idiot with Merry Christmas on his lips, and I would have him boiled in his own pudding with a steak of holly driven through his heart. <sighs> now, Uncle Scrooge, you keep Christmas in your way. Let me keep it in mine. But that's it, Uncle. You don't keep it. 
Well, what good has keeping Christmas ever done for thee? Well, I can think of many things that have done thee a world of good that haven't put a scrap of silver into my pocket and Christmas being chief amongst them. Now, if you give unto Christmas the veneration due its sacred name, why, you're still left with a time of kindness, charity, pleasantry, and, and, and more. It's a time when, when men and women realize we all walk together over the face of this earth. And though it hasn't put a scrap of gold or silver into my pocket, I will say this for Christmas, may God bless it. Which caused <laughs> Mr. Bob Cratchit to burst out into a round of applause until old Scrooge, quiet in there, shot him a look and warned, or you'll spend Christmas losing your situation. And as for you, nephew Fred, why don't you go make your speeches in Parliament? And as for you, Uncle Scrooge, why don't you come and join us for Christmas dinner tomorrow? Good afternoon, Fred. I won't let your ill humor put me out of my good humor. Therefore, my uncle, I'll offer it again. Merry Christmas. Bah humbug. And a happy new year. And a merry Christmas to you too, Mr. Cratchit. Oh, and a, a merry Christmas to you too, Mr. Fred. And to Mrs. Fred as well. Well, what have we here? My clerk. Mr. Bob Cratchit, who earns 15 shillings a week. 15 Bob, crying Merry Christmas? Ah, have I seen everything now? What to do with me? Who shuffle me off to Bedlam now. Merry Christmas! Merry Christmas! Well, as Fred exited, two distinguished gentlemen of business entered the premises of Scrooge and Marley. Um, now, uh, do, do we have the privilege, oh, uh, of addressing Mr. Scrooge or Mr. Marley? Marley's been dead seven years this very night. Oh, no doubt his remaining partner will show the same liberality expressed by the former. Scrooge cringed at the word liberality. Gentlemen, gentlemen, state your business, for I am a very busy man. Well, it's customary at this festive time of year for those of us who are more fortunate to take up a collection for those who are not. There are many who want for even the most common of creature comforts, for meat and for warmth. Um, uh, gentlemen, tell me something. Are there no prisons? Oh, plenty of prisons. And the Union Treadmill, is it still functioning? Oh, yes, but it is a dreadful sight. And the poorhouse, are its doors open, are they? Oh, yes, but I wish they would close that right up. Ah, not I. Ha, I was afraid from the way you two gentlemen were speaking, something had happened to those institutions. Oh, but they can scarcely provide the kind of Christian cheer one would hope to um, give at this festive time of year. Um, so what shall we put you down for? Nothing. Oh, you wish to remain anonymous. I wish to be left alone. I don't go round making myself merry at Christmas. I won't pay for idle people to do so. I pay for those institutions. Let them go there. But there are many who can't, and many who would rather die. Well, if they would rather die, then let them get to it and decrease the surplus population. The two distinguished men of business determining they would get no charity out of Ebenezer Scrooge, bid him a good afternoon, good afternoon, and exited the premises of Scrooge and Marley's. Their presence, however, encouraged one of those cold nosed urchins, perhaps destined for the poorhouse or the grave, to think, well, perhaps. He could earn a coin by offering through the keyhole a Christmas carol. God rest ye merry gentlemen, let nothing you dismay. Re Remember to get away, you little beggar! Get away from this door! <laughs> get away and don't come back! <laughs> and the little lad ran off into the streets of London. Scrooge came back after brandishing his ruler and found Mr. Cratchit standing there, wending his, his white woolen scarf about his neck. He didn't possess a greatcoat. Ha! I suppose you'll be wanting the whole day off tomorrow. 
Oh, yes, sir, if it's uh, quite convenient. It's not convenient. Oh, but it's only once a year, sir. Poor excuse to pick a man's pocket every December the 25th. Be here all the earlier the next day. Oh, uh, uh, yes, sir, and um, a, 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 a good afternoon to you, Mr. Scrooge. Good afternoon, Mr. Cratchit. And off went Bob Cratchit. Now, it being the occasion of Christmas Eve, when Bob arrived at ice-covered Corn Hill, whoa, whoa, <laughs> he slid up and down it whoosh, some twenty-four times. But old Ebenezer Scrooge took up his usual melancholy meal in his usual melancholy tavern, as was his melancholic habit. And under the cover of darkness, he wended his way through the streets of London, careful to avoid anyone who might have Merry Christmas upon their lips. He arrived at an old warehouse, formerly owned by his partner Jacob Marley, now converted into Scrooge's quarters. Scrooge reached into his pocket and fetched out his key, kitch clunk. But as he turned, the tumblers there seemed to turn the knocker, which had always been ordinary in every way, to, well, bear the visage of Jacob Marley. No, the face rather looked to have the color of a lobster gone bad in the basement, but it appeared to with a word left unuttered upon its lips. Scrooge scrutinized the face until it returned to being a door knocker. Kitch clunk. Ah, uh, the humbug, tis what he said. But he peered round the back of the door, expecting to see Marley's pigtail sticking out on the other side. Now old Scrooge, kept his premises cold and dark, and therefore cheap, and he liked it cheap. He exchanged his frock coat and his hat for his nightcap and gown, and then he settled himself down next to an ample fireplace, but with a meager fire, to take up his final repast of the day, a bowl of Flames in the fireplace. Boom! Flared. What's that? And the light caused all of the Dutch tiles depicting biblical scenes now to transform. And Abel, Abraham, the twelve apostles, the whole host of angels now bore the face of Jacob Marley. Scrooge then began to detect out in the corridors a tinted abulation of bells. What's that? Who's, who's out there? Who's out there, I say? Who's ringing those bells? But where it was, not only rang bells, but began to, well, drag something as if with a chain up from the bowels of the basement. Old Scrooge ran off and bolted the door thrice. Shrunk, shrunk, bah humbug is what he said. But when the doors bolted, Scrooge felt for a moment secure. But whatever it was, it continued to come on. And through that door it passed unencumbered to materialize before old Scrooge. Scrooge found it had the same frocked coat, waistcoat, boots with tassels, pigtail, and face that Marley wore in life. It is Marley. But the spirit stood, fettered in chain. Scrooge noted cash boxes, keys, ledgers, purses of steel, and other accoutrements of the trade. But 
he could see directly through this apparition right to the buttons on the back of the frock, prompting the old miser to mutter, well, they always said Marley had no guts. There's me proof. How now, spirit? What do you want with me? Much. What are you? Ask who I was. Oh, very particular for a shade, aren't we? All right then, who were you? Life, I was your partner, Jacob Marley. Hey, but can you sit down? I can, and the spirit adjusted its chains and sat. You do not believe in me. I don't. You dare doubt your own senses. Senses? Why, senses may be deceived, de de deceived by a little de de disturbance of the stomach. Ha -ha, I know what you are. You're nothing more than a, a bit of undigested beef, a, a blot of mustard, a crumb of cheese, an underdone potato. Why, there's more of gravy than grave about thee. At this, the ghost rose and unwound the bandage from its chin, causing the jaw to drop down to its chest and... Whoa! And spirit, and spirit, why, I, why do you torment me? If the spirit within a man refuses to go forth in life, in death, tis doomed to do so to see the things it may have changed, but now can not. Spirit, why are you fettered in chain? I wear the chain I forged in life. Yours was as ponderous seven years ago. Think of the work that thou hast wrought upon it since. Scrooge looked and expected to find himself fettered in chain. Spirit, wilt thou not speak some words of comfort to your old friend here? I've none to give. I am a forlorn spirit. Oh, why did I walk through life eyes downcast? Why did I not show charity? It could have been my business. But you always were a good man of business. Oh! Ebenezer Scrooge, take heed. You will be visited by three spirits. Expect the first when the clock tolls one. The next will come when the clock again tolls one. Expect the last at the tolling of midnight. Jacob, you always were a good man of business. Uh, did you suppose you could arrange for me to see them all at once and be more con oh! Approach. Take heed of the lessons these spirits will bring, and avoid my fame. The spirit caused the window to rise behind it, and then into the night it fled. Scrooge fled to the window's edge and peered upon an astounding scene. Why, the skies over London, abounded with spirits, floating about, fettered in chain. Some were locked together as if caught in some government conspiracy, and all moaned, unable to help the unfortunate, the poor, the ailing. They wailed. Finding it unbearable, Scrooge brought down the window. Bump! Humbug! And then he retreated behind the night curtain to his bed. Well, what was that? One o'clock! <laughs> no spirits of 
about. Oh, just about of indigestion, that's... Whoosh. Well, the night curtain flew open, and there Scrooge found his establishment bathed in an ethereal light emanating from a fluctuating spirit flitting about, limbs indistinct. It had a jet of light emanating from its head. It wore a gown of white adorned with summer flowers. In one hand, it held a sprig of holly. In the other, a great comb with white hair but smooth skin. It looked at once young and old. Are you the spirit who was foretold would come unto me? I am. Come, come. Come? What are you? I am the ghost of Christmas past. Your past. Come. Oh, I can't flit about like you spirits. I'm a mere mortal likely to fall. Then bear but the touch of my hand upon thine heart, and thou shalt be lifted up in more ways than one. The good ghost touched the heart of Ebenezer Scrooge, and at once the walls in his establishment dissolved, and Scrooge, oh, oh where am I? found himself in a snow-covered field. People passing by cry, Merry Christmas! Give my best Merry Christmas! Oh, Merry Christmas! I haven't seen you in... Ah, ha, ha! Merry Christmas! But they ignored him. Well, you know, out upon Merry Christmas. The spirit, however, explained, They are but shadows of your past. They cannot with us engage. Dost thou remember this place? Long it's been since thou hast thought upon it. Spirit, do I remember this place? <laughs> I was a boy here. I could walk it blindfolded. Then come. And the good ghost brought Ebenezer Scrooge to the old brick schoolhouse, the walls lined with moss. It should have been shuttered down for the Christmas holiday, but left behind, there remained one solitary student, talking to imaginary characters gleaned from the books he'd been reading. Now listen, Ali Baba, you and the Forty Thieves will join me, Ebenezer Scrooge, for Christmas dinner, and we'll also have the company of, of, of uh, Robinson Crusoe and his Man Friday. Spirit, spirit, this, this boy, why, how can it be me? The spirit replied by again wavering its arms. A few more years passed by, and Scrooge saw himself a student a little older, but now there entered a girl in a neat dress. Eben? Eben? Franny, what are you doing here at school? Father sent me. Father, what does he want? Oh, he's so much kinder these days. Last night, I was able to ask, I said, Father, may Ebenezer come home for Christmas? He said, yes. He sent me in a coach to fetch you. We'll spend Christmas together. We'll spend Christmas together. We'll spend Christmas together. And Scrooge watched himself, a lad going off with his sister. Spirit, my sister Fran had a large heart. Yes, and she died, giving birth to your nephew Fred. Is that a tear upon your cheek? No, Spirit, it's a pimple. And the good ghost of Christmas past again wavered its arms and delivered Ebenezer Scrooge to a warehouse in London. Dost thou know this place? Know this place? It's Fezziwigs. <laughs> I, I was an apprentice here. And then they were inside, and old Scrooge saw himself, now a young man. Oh, look at me there, look at me there, so diligent. At the, at the ledgers, oh, I made sure I dotted every I and crossed every T. Oh, look who's next to me, ha, Dickie Wilkins. Oh, he was so fond of me, ha, ha. Oh, look, look, spirit up there. Why, it's old Fezziwig. He's coming down from his high offices. Watch, watch how his wig, there it goes, ha, ha, hits the ceiling. 
Hilly ho, Ebenezer, cheer up, Dicky. No more work. It's Christmas Eve. Christmas Eve. Come, come, push back the desk, clear the place out. Let's get ready for the revel. And it was done in a flash. And in the next instant, there entered the musician who made his um, orchestra up in Fezziwig's office, and he brings out his violin and proceeds to tune it up. But um, at first it. Sounds rather like, um, the 50 sour stomach aches there, um... Can you get it there, Jim? I think. Oh, but... but next, in comes <clears throat> Mrs. Fezziwig. Husband, husband, are we ready for the revels? Oh, it looks like we are. There's the musician. Oh, he's handsome. Ah! Oh, oh where are the girls? Girls? Girls, what you get in here? Uh, your father's ready for the revels. Come in, come in. And in come the three Miss Fezziwigs. Beaming, adorable, pretty. And they're followed by the six young men whose hearts they had broken. But every one of those suitors hoped to get a Miss Fezziwig underneath the mistletoe, you know. And then they are followed in by all those in the employ of Fezziwig. In come the other clerks, the charwoman and her cousin, the milkman and his mother. And some come in sly, some come in shy. But they all line up in two long sets, ready to dance a long contra reel. And the fiddler finds his way to a tune. And they go up and down the set. But then the head couple, it gets a little tangled up there, and so old Fessywig and his wife, they take over, calling out, Turn the corkscrew! Thread the needle! Oh, there we go! And when Fessywig comes dancing by, why, his legs positively shone out with the spirit of St. Vitus, and they glowed forth with a light all their own, and the young folk, they couldn't keep up with old Fessywig, and then in they come with trays laden with cold roast and plenty of twelfth night cake and cold beer and Scrooge marvels at the entire scene. Watching the faces floating by, he loses track of the good ghost, who says, See what a few of your mortal pounds has brought? Oh, these silly folk are so filled with gratitude over this small matter. Small matter? But look what it brought, lasting happiness. Now come. And the good ghost again fluctuated its arms, bringing Ebenezer Scrooge to see himself still a young man. But now the lines of avarice had begun to etch his face. And beside him stood a young woman in a mourning dress, and in the light of the good ghost, the tear on her cheek glistened like a jewel. It's no use now, Ebenezer. An idol has come between us. Belle, an idol? A golden one. Belle, the reason I work hard is there is nothing as harsh in this world as poverty. You fear this world too much. Why, gain engrosses you, not me. Ebenezer Scrooge, I must release you from your promise. Belle, what do you mean? Uh, no, no, Belle, please, not that. Belle, Belle, well, are, are you leaving me? I hope you're happy in the life you've chosen. Ebenezer Scrooge. No, Belle, don't go. Please give me a little bit more time. Belle, no, Belle, no, no, spirit. Show me no more of this. Stop, don't break my heart again. Stop it. Belle, Belle. Ugh. And old Scrooge snatched the cone away from the good ghost and began to quell its light. Stop. Stop tormenting me, spirit. Show me no more of this. <laughs> oh, Belle. <laughs> what was that? Is it already one o'clock? Have I slept away the 
day into the afternoon? Ebenezer Scrooge! Ebenezer Scrooge! Come forth and see me! The night curtain flew open, and Scrooge found a great, brilliant light filling his establishment, and the place was adorned with holly, ivy, mistletoe, and all about he saw great tables laden with slabs of beef, thrones of turkey, piles of poultry, there were lobsters fresh climbing out of baskets, there were cherry-cheeked apples, chestnuts, pears partly as princes, twelfth night cakes, and who presided easily over this entire scene? A grand, jolly spirit! Ha 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 ha! I am the spirit of Christmas present. Scrooge looked upon it, uh, gawking, and it said, You have never seen the likes of me. Scrooge looked at the holly crowning its head, its long flowing brown locks and beard, a mantle throne showing its capacious bare chest, and in one hand it held an uncommon torch. No, I've never seen the likes of thee. Ha 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 ha! Never met any of my brothers before. How many of them do you have? Over 1840. Oh, that's a rather large family to feed. Ha 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 Spirit, spirit, last night I learned a lesson. Pray what of you to teach, to teach me? Touch but the hem of my robe. Scrooge obliged and at once found himself flying high over the city of London amidst the steeples, the towers, and down below, what an astounding scene! He could see everyone in the marketplace. Why, there were the green grocers, the baker, the butchers, the fruitiers, and people bustling about, and Scrooge marveled at the scene, but the spirit took heed of those with more meager meals, sprinkling them with its torch. And Scrooge noted, once sprinkled, smiles creased their faces. Now, when a baker carrying a twelfth night cake jostled into a butcher with a slab of beef, Hey, watch where you're going there! Watch where I'm going! You watch where you're going! Or you're going to get one of these right across your pate! Oh, you get two of these across? And that'll give you a Merry Christmas! And I'll give you a Happy New Year! <laughs> what, are we, what are we fighting for? It's Christmas! Yeah, what are we fighting for? And off they went, causing Scrooge to wonder, Spirit, what's in that torch of thine? None come and mix of mine own. Is it good for all? Yea, but especially for the poor. Pray why the poor? Come, I'll show you. And the good ghost of Christmas present brought Ebenezer Scrooge to Camden Town, to the four-room home of his clerk, Mr. Bob Cratchit. And there, the sprinkles from the torch were given liberally, and the great ghost tucked itself away in a corner uh, quite well, with Scrooge there undetected. Now, Mrs. Cratchit presided. She wore a dress turned twice, made brave with ribbons, as did her younger daughters. Come, come, Peter, mash up the potatoes, no lumps there. Yes, Mother, I know, there'll not be a lump here from here to Christmas. Oh, is Father home yet? No, he's still at church with Tiny Tim. We expect Martha. Oh, here she is. Oh, oh, Mother, never did I think I'd ever get home. The ladies in the hattier, there they are saying, oh, how does this one look? Maybe I'll try that. Oh, drove me, why, out of my mind. Tomorrow I'm gonna sleep late as a lady in waiting. Is father in yet? No, at church with Tiny Tim. Well, I'll tell you what, why don't we play a little jape on him? I'll hide, and you pretend like I have to work late at the Attiers. Oh, yes, that'll be good fun. And Martha tucked herself away, right next to the good ghost and Scrooge. And then, he's coming, he's coming cried the Cratchit children. Oh. The door opened, and there stood Bob Cratchit, upon his shoulder, the youngest of his children, a frail little boy with an iron brace, a wooden crutch, and an ever-present smile. There we are, Tim. Ah, back 
from church? Oh, Mrs. Cratchit, are we all here? Oh, yes, Bob. Oh, same for Martha. Martha? Not here? Oh, no, she's going to be working late at the, at the Hattier's tonight. <gasps> no, she is not! She is not! She is not! I'm going to march right over there now. I'm going to fetch her. I'm going to bring her back. Oh, Bob, oh, we need her more than that Hattier does. I don't care if she loses her situation. Martha couldn't bear it. She comes running out. Oh, Father, you silly soul. And she kisses him and he turns around. Oh, my Martha, my Martha. It could not be Christmas Eve without all we Cratchits together. What is it, Tim? Father, Father, what about the, the figgy pudding? Oh, well, it's in the baker's. It, it's, it's, it's baking there. Yay, but how will we know when it's ready? Someone has to go in and listen for it to sing and then taste it. Oh. Now that would be someone who well knows pudding. Now let me see if there's someone here in this house who knows pudding. Uh, Peter, do you know um, pudding? Oh no, I just know potatoes. Children, we just know sage is an onion. Mrs. Cratchit, no. Well, Tim, why don't you do this? Take your sister Martha over there and you listen for that pudding to sing and give it a taste. Let us know if it's right. All oh, right. Oh. And off went Tim holding his sister's hand. It would have done you good to see how quick he moved with that crutch. Bob, how was Tim in church today? Oh, Mrs. Cratchit, good as gold and getting better. Why, when services were ending, I, I says to him, I says, Tim, do you mind when people gawk at you? Here's what he says. He says, no, Father. Because I know when they're looking at me, they're putting the mind to remember the one who made the blind see and the lame walk. Pearls from the lips of our babe. You'll see, Mrs. Cratchit. He'll get better. He'll be hale and hearty. He will. Now, Bob, calm thyself. But why don't you call all in? I think the goose is about ready. Call all in. Come on in, come on in, Cratchits. Christmas dinner, Christmas Eve dinner, I should say. Christmas Eve dinner, come on in. And all the Cratchits come running in, the younger ones, with spoons in their mouths. Mm -hmm. Lest they shriek with joy before the goose is ready to be served. But Tiny Tim made certain of that, leading the chant. We want the goose. We want the goose. So off goes Mrs. Cratchit, and she comes in, carrying a tray with a, with a decent-looking goose there. And old Scrooge turns, Spirit, isn't that a meager goose to feed such a large family? But the Cratchits, they applaud, they cheer. What a fine goose. It's the best goose ever. Everyone shall have a, a fine goose now to eat, shouldn't we? And they serve it all up and they're eating and enjoying and saying, would you like some of mine? I'm stuffed. No, I've had enough. And when they discover that there's, why, a bit of bone, skin, they shriek, leftovers? Aren't we rich? Oh. And then, we want the pudding. We want the pudding. So off goes Martha to the bakery, and she returns, taking the towel off of the pudding, the place it once smells like the bakery and the laundry. There it is. The pudding looks like a cannonball. I would gauge it to be a 12-pound shot, speckled, but bedight with a spray of holly. And the Cratchits, they look upon it, and no one says what a meager pudding to feed such a large family would have been heresy. They wouldn't have thought of it. They, they cheer and say, how delicious. Did you get enough? Would you like some of mine? And then, when they're done with the pudding, Bob encourages, all rise, all rise. A toast. A Merry Christmas to us all. Merry Christmas, Merry Christmas, Merry Christmas, Merry Christmas. They sit, save for Tim, who adds, and may God bless us, every one. Spirit, tell me, 
Will this child live? I see, in the corner, the carefully preserved crutch. If these shadows remain unaltered by the future, the child will die. No, no, spirit. Say the child will live. If the child should die, then let him get to it and decrease the surplus population. Scrooge hung his head, hearing his own words thrown back at him. Man, listen. Discover what surplus is. It may be in the eyes of heaven that your life is worth less than the life of this poor man's child and millions like him. And then Bob Cratchit rises again and holds up a glass. Come, come, stand all, stand all. A toast? Who are we toasting this time, Father? To the founder of our feast, Mr. Ebenezer Robert. You're not going to make your children toast that odious old skinflint, are you? Now, now, Mrs. Cratchit, it's Christmas Eve. Now, now, Bob, fie upon that miser. Shh, 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 Mrs. Cratchit, it's Christmas Eve. No cursing, I pray thee. Come, come. Where's your charitable spirit? Oh, Bob. Well, it's for your sake, children. Lift your glasses. Come, a toast to the health of the founder of our feast, Mr. Ebenezer Scrooge. Blah! There, I've done it. And the good ghost lifted up Ebenezer Scrooge and took him far away from Camden Town. They flew out over the countryside and the spirit peered into hovels and cottages where people with meager meals were given sprinkles from its torch. It lit up the shack of a miner and his family dining over potatoes. It put smiles on the faces of the lighthouse keeper and his wife. It brought them out to a ship at sea with the wind howling and the waves roaring and smashing and the sailors looking forlorn until after it gave its sprinkle, they found the two words lifted the harshness and dread. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas, a humbug. That is exactly what he said when I tried to invite him to come to dine with us. Now, the ghost had brought Ebenezer Scrooge into the premises of his nephew, Fred. I couldn't believe it. Oh, I could believe it, my good husband. You know what kind of a man your uncle is. Why, he is a miserly skin flint, and he is stubborn, braying, a jackass of a sort. Now, now, my good wife, pray thee, hold thy tongue. It's Christmas Eve, after all, and after all, he is his own worst enemy. Now, come, come, why did we have a little game here of yes and no? Mr. Topper! Are you under the mistletoe again with my single sister-in-law? Come, come, let's play yes and no. But now the good ghost tugged at Ebenezer Scrooge. It already had diminished in size. But Scrooge begged, oh please, spirit, they're about to play yes and no. Uh, I was quite good at that. And the spirit relented, and Fred went on. Now, I'll answer with a yes or a no. See if you can guess my thoughts. I'm thinking of a savage animal. Oh, I know what it is. A bear. No, Mr. Topper. I'm thinking of a braying creature. Oh, I know what it is. A, a donkey. Mm, no. Or I could say yes. Oh, you're supposed to say yes or no. I am thinking of a stubborn creature, a hard-headed creature. Oh, I know what it is. I know what it is, husband. It's it's your uncle, Ebenezer Scrooge. <laughs> yes, that's right. Oh, I guessed it. Oh, I was about to guess it too. A stubborn brain creature, Ebenezer Scrooge. Spirit! Beneath your feet! Claws! What's there? What's there? The good ghost opened up its gowns and revealed two sallow, shriveled, shrunken children with distended eyes and grasping hands like claws. Spirit, are, are they yours? They are mankind's. This one is want, this one ignorance. Beware them both, but especially the boy. The spirit. Have they no refuge? 
Are there no prisons? Are there no workhouses? Spirit! Spirit! Where, where are you going? Spirit! Spirit! Where are you going? Are there no treadmills? Spirit! Don't leave me here! The, the darkness! The darkness! What? Was that twelve? Is it already? Middle of the night? Oh, Spirit! Spirit! Where am I? Oh! Oh! I, I think I know. You! You! There hovered a darkened shadow, more impenetrable than any night. A shrouded figure where there should have been a face that emanated a ghastly glow of light. Are you the spirit of the Christmas yet to come? Are you here to, to, to show me things as they might be but are not yet? Say something to me. Spirit, spirit, say something to me, please. I fear you most, spirit. Please, what is to be the fate of this miserable miser? It pointed a bony finger. Scrooge looked in that direction and found himself at once in a reputable neighborhood in London. Some distinguished men of business were having a laugh over someone's demise. Did you hear what happened last night? Oh, what's that? Old Scratch finally caught up with him. Oh, I thought even the devil would be afraid of him. Oh, I did too, but I'm afraid no one will go to mourn him. Well, I know how I would go to mourn him. Oh, you would not. Oh, yes, I would. Well, how would you go to mourn him? Well, if he were to pay me. Oh, ho, ho, ho. you know him. He would never pay even for something like that. Well, then he'll have no one to go to mourn him. <laughs> oh, you're right about that. <laughs> Spirit. Whose, whose death do they mock? Scrooge looked in the direction pointed by the bony finger of the ghost of Christmas yet to come. And he found himself in a disreputable end of London at a pawnbroker's with a stringy-haired proprietor watching with beetling eyes three furtive thing figures wending their way through the streets of London. Uh... Come in, come in, says the spider to the fly. Welcome to Joe's. Ha ha ha. I see we have a repeat customer here. Miss the charwoman of the recently deceased. Oh, and we're graced with the long to rest. Ha ha ha. And we got royalty here too. With the undertaker. Ha ha ha. Come in, come in. What you got? What you got for old Joe here? You're going to want to give me nine shillings for it, Joe. Nine shillings. Ha ha ha. Oh, it's a fine one. Oh, but tell me, how'd you get it? Nah, don't tell me. I know you. I know what you did. As soon as you hear him stop breathing, you sneaks in. <laughs> I know you. And you tear down the velvet curtain and you bring it right over here, didn't you? Yes, I did, Joe. I take care of myself. Not like him. Imagine, Joe, what he did. He let himself die in that cold, biting, bleak old place. Ghosts rattling about. Ooh. All right, give me the shillings, give me the shillings. Here you go, here you go. All right, Londres, what you got for old Joe here? Ha, ha, ha. Well, this linen shirt. Oh, what a fine wave it is. Where'd you get it, huh? <laughs> Where'd you get it? Well, I know what you did. You're just like this one. You went sneaking in there. The body not even cold. You stripped it off him and 
You left him naked for the Undertaker here. <laughs> I know you, that's what you did. Left him naked for the Undertaker. <laughs> no, no. No, Joe, he, we weren't naked. When I found him, he was all in calico. <laughs> him in calico. <laughs> <laughs> Calico! <laughs> well, you see, Joe, the way I figured it, I thought he's not going to be needing this shirt. Not where he's going. Oh, yeah, he'd be likely to get it burned down there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, look, look here, Joe, look what I got. You see that? Oh, links, buttons. How'd you get him? Well, the only way to get anything out of him, I pried him out of his cold, dead hand. <laughs> Spirit! Whose death do they mock? A good ghost responded by bringing Ebenezer Scrooge back to Camden Town to a scene now as Miserable as before had been merry. There stood Peter and Martha and Mrs. Cratchit, awaiting Bob, who was behind his time. Well, Martha, wouldn't you say that Father walks so much more slowly these days? Oh, of course, Peter. Why, with Tim, he, he would walk twice as fast as anyone else. And now, and now. Oh, Martha, don't get me started again. Both of you, please. Hold back those tears. Your father's about to walk through the kitchen club. Oh. Mrs. Cratchit. Peter. Martha. Oh, pray thee. No more tears. Well, it isn't much, but I bring two bits of hope. I, I just came from visiting the place where our... where... where he's to rest. It's such a peaceful pleasant place. Why, it'll lift up our souls whenever we go to visit. My child, my sweet child. Oh, another bit of hope. When I was coming here, I met Mr. Fred. He shook me hand heartily and he said, sincere, always, Mr. Cratchit, will we remember your tiny Tim, our tiny Tim, will always remember him. Isn't it true, Peter? What will you remember? He never complained. Martha, his smile. Mrs. Cratchit. Oh, Bob. What can I say? Our Tim was the essence of God. Spirit, I know my time with thee is short. Pray tell, what is to be the fate of this, of this miserable miser? The ghost of Christmas yet to come brought Ebenezer Scrooge to a desolate graveyard, and it pointed down with those bone fingers. Scrooge fell to his knees and began to push apart the leaves and the dirt and the worms until... Ah! Spirit! Ebenezer Scrooge! Oh, Spirit! Pray, am I dead? Am I, am I already dead? Spirit, where are you going? No, don't leave me. Spirit, tell me, tell me, is there a way to, to sponge out this thing? Spirit, don't leave me here! Spirit! Listen, spirit, I will take heed. I will listen to the lessons given unto me by the ghosts of Christmas, past, present, and yet to come. But please tell me there's a way to sponge this. Where are you? Spirit, spirit. Oh, oh, what? Ah, is that you, spirit? Oh, please. Forgive this miserable miser. <laughs> Dear me. <laughs> <laughs> huh? What's this? My my bedpost? Bedpost? Ah, a bedpost. Oh, 
I'm on my bed. Uh, uh, I think I'm on my bed. Oh, let's see. Oh, look. Here it is. My ghoulie ball. Uh, uh, oh, I'm not dead. I'm not dead. Oh, oh, oh I'm not dead. Oh, but, but, but have I missed it? Scrooge flew open to the window and threw it up and looked out upon an illuminated day in London. He cried out to a boy passing by. Hello there, my boy. What do you want? Uh, tell me, what day is it today? What? Why, it's Christmas Day. Christmas Day? That means I haven't missed it. Oh, my boy, those spirits, when they work, those ghosts do it quick. Oh, ho, 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 ho. Go on, you walker. Uh, tell me something, uh, my boy. Do you know the polter around the corner? I should think so. Is that prize-winning turkey still in the window? You mean the one as big as me? Oh, what a bright boy we have here. That's the very one I want you to purchase for me. Now, take this coin and you purchase that turkey and come back with the polterer. Be back here in less than five minutes. I'll give you half a crown. <laughs> and off runs the little fellow and he's back. And there comes this polterer carrying in the turkey saying, Where do you want this, governor? Oh, it's not for me. Boy, what are you bringing me out here? Because even want it. Uh, no, no, I want it, but I want you to deliver it to Mr. Bob Cratchit in, in Camden Town. Camden Town? How am I going to get this turkey to Camden Town? Oh, you'll need a cab. <whistles> cabby! Cabby! Ha, ha! <whistles> oh, oh, oh. Ah. Merry Christmas to you, Governor. Where are we going? Where are we going? Uh, Merry Christmas to you, too. Uh, well, I'm not going anywhere except, oh, a little bit uh, uh, too merry here, but I want you to take this fellow over here with the turkey and the boy. The turkey's the one in the middle. <laughs> over to Mr. Bob Cratchit's in Camden Town. Uh, Camden Town? Now, that, that's quite the, the, the fair there. Well, uh, tell you what, um, will this do? And you can keep the change. Ho, ho, ho! Well, Merry Christmas, Governor! I mean, my lord! Thank you very much! Come, let's go! Ha, ha! Oh, off they go, and off I go. I'm as, 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 as silly as a schoolboy. Oh, uh, it's Christmas, and Scrooge dressed himself, went out into the streets of London, offering Merry Christmas, Merry Christmas, Merry Christmas to you. Oh, gentlemen, gentlemen, forgive me for the rude treatment I gave you in my counting house last night. I wish to make amends. Oh, and what is that, Mr. Scrooge? Well, I wish to make a contribution to your fund. To our fund? Yes, of, um... Mr. Scrooge, that is most generous, and not a farthing less. Well, a Merry Christmas to you, Mr. Scrooge. Merry Christmas, Merry Christmas indeed. Scrooge made his way to a church, went inside and lifted his voice with the choir singing. God rest ye merry gentlemen, let nothing you dismay. Remember, oh, I remembered, I'm invited to dine at Fred's. And Scrooge went over there, bum, bum, bum and knocked upon the door, and when Mrs. Fred oh, opened it up and she saw Scrooge on the doorstep, why, you could have knocked her over with a... Um, Fred? Fred, could you come here? What is it? Mrs. Can't you answer the door? No, you have to see who is here at the door. Oh, she can't even answer the door. Oh, Uncle Scrooge? Do I owe you money? No, no, Fred. I owe you an apology. Is the invite to dine still good? Oh, yes, uncle. Come in, come in. Uh, and, and Fred, forgive me and Merry Christmas. Oh, Merry Christmas, Uncle Scrooge. And Scrooge came in and sat down and enjoyed a fine feast. And he was the best at yes and no. And you know, the next morning, Scrooge got into the counting house early. He wanted to catch Bob Cratchit coming in late. Mr. Cratchit, is that you? You're 18 minutes behind your time. Oh, forgive me, Mr. Scrooge. What? I, I was making rather merry last night. Were you now? Oh, but it's only once a year, sir. Only once a year? Mr. Cratchit. Something has to be done about that! Oh, pray what? Get over here. 
Something will be done about this. Now you listen to me, Mr. Cratchit. This is not going to go on the way it's been any longer. We are going to put an end to it right now. And therefore, Mr. Cratchit, I'm going to... I'm going to double your salary! <laughs> Merry Christmas! Merry Christmas! Oh, help, help, help! Scrooge has gone mad! We've got to get him to Bedlam! No, no, Bob! I am not mad at all! I'm in my right mind! Come and sit down! And they sat down and they talked over Bob's future over a bowl of smoking bishop. And old Scrooge proved as good as was his word. He became as good a man as ever was known in London, in Great Britain, and there I'm going to say it, in all the world. And to Tiny Tim, who did not die, Scrooge became like a second father. Now there were some who doubted the change in Scrooge's heart, but he cherished it and let it shine out. He had no more engagements with the spirits. And in the end, they said this about Ebenezer Scrooge. He's a man who keeps Christmas well. And well, now they can say that about us after watching a Christmas carol here. Oh, but one lasting thing. The words of Tiny Tim. May God bless us, every one. And thank you all for watching A Christmas Carol with Jonathan Crook, your storyteller.